Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Everything. I'm coming back at you with another Wargaming in Miniature video. And in this video, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be mounting these on these 40 millimeter by 40 millimeter Litco Aero bases. I had some 20 by 40s, but I decided that it was unnecessary to do individually, like two figures per base. I'm going to actually put four figures per base because the Romans in this game fight in Hail Caesar, they fight in two ranks. And uh, you, you will never not have them in two ranks. So uh, all I needed to do is pull six of these out because each of these popsicle sticks has four figures and four figures per base. And uh, so you can line these up in a, uh, in a testudo. So you could have four figures by four figures. That would be, or yeah, that would be a testudo because they want you to have a square formation for a testudo. You can go in uh, march column. You can also go in combat uh, formation, which is the line. Uh, and this will give you the same unit frontage as like the Macedonians. Now these other two bases I'll be adding to a future unit that I do. Because uh, if I get another box, I'll have another six bases. And that will allow for f uh, a unit of four and then another unit of four. So I'll have three units out of two out of two boxes. Now I've just seen, notice how easy that figure just pops right off the popsicle stick. Uh, the Elmer's glue allows that allows the figures just to pop pop right off. So now what we're doing here is I'm going to eventually pop all of these off, and then I'm going to put arrange them onto the stands kind of generally how I want them on there um, it's and then I push I put the bases together to kind of make sure that uh, swords don't bump into bodies and everybody's able to fit on the bases and then I will put them in March column as well to make sure that the uh, the guy behind the figures don't bump into the guys in front you know so basically what I'm saying is I will not glue them I'll just place them on the bases and then I will move the bases around to ensure that the figures don't interfere with each other now you notice how these just come right off they just pop right off alright so let me go ahead and get that done and then I'll be right back alright now we're gonna go ahead and arrange the bases in a nice convenient position and I'm going to put the figures on. Now what I'm going to do is get some Elmer's glue, some white PVA glue, and I'm going to put four drops on each base. Basically a, equidistant apart. These are where the figures are going to stand and uh, basically I'm just going to go ahead and prep all the bases with, whoa that's off center, and just to get them ready to go. And you see I'm putting quite a bit of Elmer's, uh, if you consider that quite a bit because uh, when I push the base of the figure onto the Litco Arrow base I do want the Elmers to kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, get pressed out from underneath the base so that it will create kind of a a lip or a, a, a vice grip around the outer edge of the base uh, when I push it on there, you'll see the white glue kind of squirt out of the bottom of the bases. And what that does is it allows the Elmers to grip. Because if you look at the bottom of these bases, I completely made them smooth. I used my exacto to smooth them down. So Elmers will not want to stick to them. Uh, but they'll stick to the outer edge and they'll keep it from moving around. Now, in addition to the Elmers glue, once everything's dry, I am going to be applying my spackle to this as well. So the spackle, in addition to the Elmer's and uh, the flock, the, when I glue the flock on, that's also going to be holding all the figures in place. There you go. There's my, my standard bearer, my musician, my leader, the centurion. All right, so now I glue these figures down and uh, let me go ahead and glue all these down and then I'll be right back. Now I wanted to point this out as well. Uh, you only get one shield with pylum per sprue. So what I did was I put one 
pylum shield on each base and I ensured that I put that shield in the front rank. Uh, so that was just me. It, it was no, it's not necessary to do that. I just thought that it would be cool to have the guys in the front rank with pylums, you know, in the, holding their pylums. All right, so I get all this done. I'll be right back. All right, now they're all, you know, with glued down. You can see the Elmers how it's squished out of the sides of the bases. That's going to grip them and hold them onto the Litgo Aero bases. Now these are like 0 .08 thickness bases are super thin uh, so I plan to put foam underneath them as well okay I'm putting them side by side to make whoops I'm putting them side by side to make sure that they can all stand in formation I'm also going to put them in line uh, that's in line I'm going to put them in column I'm going to put them in testudo as well just to make sure that they all fit uh, basically while the glue is wet this would be the perfect time to make any kind of an, an adjustment or an arrangement because uh, once it dries you're not going to be able to move these guys at all. Alright so once I get uh, them dry I'll be back. Alright these guys are 90 percent dry I figured they were good enough to handle so what we're going to do is because the base is so thin it's like uh, 0.08 millimeters uh, it's or maybe it's 0.8 millimeters, whatever the Litco one is that they use that's their thinnest base. Uh, I have some foam it's before I put the spackle on there, I'm going to put the foot. Whoops, boink. I'm going to put some foam on. Now this is something called foamy. I get it at Hobby Lobby. It has an adhesive tape on the back, uh, so you just peel it and stick it. Uh, what's really cool is it actually cuts with scissors or an exacto knife. Uh, so what I do is I'll flip it over. And there should be a white side. I'm getting everything out of the way. I'm probably trying to look for my X-Acto knife and a pencil. There you go. Flip it over. And then what I'm going to do is take a, a single base from one of the Romans. And I'm going to put it on there to make a measurement. And then I'm going to, and then I'm going to make a little stencil. And then I just cut around or draw around. I'm sorry. Draw around the base with my mechanical pencil. Okay, what am I trying to do? Hold on to it. Okay. There you go. And there you go. Simple enough. And then I'm going to cut that out. Uh, and then when I cut it out, when I start cutting, I'll be right back. All right, I'm just cutting this using an X-Acto knife. It cuts super easy. And then uh, I'm just going to cut all six of these squares, uh, these 40 millimeter by 40 millimeter squares out. And then I'll be right back. All right, now that they're cut out, we just go ahead and peel the backing off of it. Like I said, it has an, it has a uh, adhesive on the back. Uh, and then I just grab one of my figures. I place it on the square, line it up to the best of my abilities. And it doesn't have to be perfect. And if you notice, this black base, this foam, is actually, it wind up, wound up being slightly larger than my Litco base. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So then you just grab a pair of scissors. Okay, well, I'm going to try it with an X-Acto knife. Uh, X-Acto knives are not great because you notice how I can't get this X-Acto knife to go straight up and down because of the handle of the X-Acto knife. I'm struggling here. Uh, it's actually quite easy to use a pair of scissors. Uh, just, just laugh at me while I'm doing it with this knife. You can see how horrible a cut it is. And I'm going back and forth and just giggle while, I, while you're watching this. I'm like, what the heck am I doing? It's not working. Screw that. I'm going to grab the pair of scissors. Okay, so I grab my scissors. <laughs> the blade of the scissor can lay right next to the wood. You just cut it. Boom. Done. Peel it off. Super fast. And it's perfect. It go, It's like a perfect cut. I've done it before like that with my American War of Independence. I don't know why I didn't start with the scissors this time. <laughs> Alright, so let me go ahead and get all these black bases uh, stuck and cut and then I'll be right back. Alright so now they're all cut and stuck and you can see that the bases now have a little bit of girth so you can actually handle the miniatures by lifting the bases. That is one thing I don't like doing on a miniature game. I don't like grabbing the figures. I actually prefer grabbing the bases and if the bases are super thin the uh, that's hard to do. So 
I go back and make sure that all these uh, things are cut in a, in a way that this is going to look like a good formation. So I line them all up. Just check it all out. Okay, now that they're looking good like this, um, I wanted to point out why we put the uh, Drydex spackle on the base. Uh, let me go ahead and pull a base up and so you can kind of see. Each, if you look at the bases that are molded with the model, the they actually stand on these little bumps, right? The little plastic bases. You notice that there's a sharp edge between it and the base. Well, that is too sharp for me. So what I do is I just put a little spackle around the bases to give it kind of a gentle, a more gentle slope so that it doesn't look like they're standing on a rock. It, it'll eventually it'll make them look like they're all standing on kind of level ground or all on the same thing. Now, it'll still slope down a little bit to the edge of the base, but uh, in general, it will elevate the area between the model spaces to give it a more gentle or more um, yeah level level ground that they would be on. Okay, so using my little spackle applicator, all you got to do is just apply the spackle, uh, putty, any kind, of, anything. You could use anything really if you really wanted to go crazy. You could use uh, green stuff or you can use Tamiya putty, but I'm telling you the, the Drydex is a lot cheaper. You're getting a big tub, uh, half a gallon for like four bucks. So, yeah. And it goes on pink, as you can see, and it will, when it dries, it dries white. Yeah, you can see that in the text right there. <laughs> and sometimes in the past, I will put the spackle on the base itself, uh, but I don't think you really need to do that, um, but sometimes I'll do that just to make, uh, just to give some variety. And it's okay if the spackle gets on their boot or their, uh, I guess it's not a boot, I guess it's a sandal, or if it gets on the shield or their weapon or whatever, it's okay. I'm just trying my best to not have that happen. But if it does, I when I go to paint it, I will actually just paint that spackle brown like I'm going to paint the dirt anyway and then what that'll do is it'll make it look like a little dirt got on his sandal or it'll make it like dirt got on his shield or whatever so now you can kind of see what I'm doing here I'm just putting spackle around the bases now and it's okay to get it along the edge of the foam as well it doesn't matter it actually just adds a little okay yeah it just adds a little um, life to the model it's like uh, real life because I hate those bases how they now you can disguise the base some like I've seen some people will like put a super glue along the outer edge of the bases to kind of give it a gentle slope but that when super glue dries it kind of shrinks so much that you don't really get a, a, a bead what you get is um, kind of like a convex like a like a what's like a ramp and I don't want a ramp I want it to be uh, it look make it look like they're all standing on level ground so I'm trying to fill the areas between the bases and then on the outside of the bases I'll have it slope down to the edge of the base if that makes sense now the tricky part is getting it under the shield and uh, so I use both ends of my applicator I got a fat end, like a shovel on one end, and I got a thin, pointy toothpick end on the other end that I will use to get down inside all the, guess what, nooks and crannies. Yeah, now this, now getting inside between the figures is the most difficult. That's where you just have to be very careful not to ruin the beautiful paint job that you did to the figure. Just got to be very careful. Find paths and, uh ways to get in there to put that putty in there so just be careful that's that's the that's the most tricky part of this whole process see how i got to be very careful getting it between the shields that's the most tricky part of this whole process okay so let me get all these guys done and then we'll be back and we'll let we'll let them dry uh they dry by turning white so when they're white we'll bring them back i'll see you then Okay, they're all pink now. Uh, let me put this water up 
and I'll move it out of the side and just kind of give you a view of all of them with the putty. Uh, this putty does take a couple of hours to dry. So um, through the benefit of uh, movie magic, we'll be back once they turn all white. All right, guys, now that they are dry, and it is actually the next day, I went ahead and went to sleep. And when I got back up, I decided I was going to go ahead and paint these guys brown. And uh, what we're going to use is nutmeg. And now I'm going to put some nutmeg in the, in the uh, palette here. We're going to paint between the legs and all over the spackle and also the sides of the bases. But we need to, uh, we're going to add a little water to the nutmeg as well. Now I'm using Apple Barrel uh, because I was able to buy this giant bottle of, uh, for, I don't know, pennies on a dollar. I think it was a dollar for this giant bottle of paint. Uh, couldn't pass it up. Now I'm noticing this paint is actually quite thick. Apple Barrel is normally thin. So, uh, but I'm noticing when I'm putting it in the palette that it's quite thick. So I decide I'm just going to go ahead and add a little water to thin that out a little bit. Because what that actually does is it actually makes the, wa the, the paint watery, which is good. I don't want it to be a wash. I want it to still be paint, but I do want it to have a little bit of that water consistency so that when I paint it on the spackle, it actually will soak into the spackle and it will also, uh, it'll give a slight two-tone effect. You'll see, you'll see when I'm painting it in there that uh, some of the raised areas will be lighter and some of the uh, deeper areas will be darker. A lot like a wash, um, but I'm going to consider it mostly paint. It's, you know, 90% paint, 10% water. All right, guys, let's go ahead and start painting on this base. Um, I'm using a soft bristle brush, a fairly large one, so that I can get down in between all the cracks and uh, carry a lot of paint to the model uh, quickly. So I've got to get everything positioned just right for my handles. I had to change focus a little bit because the uh, miniatures weren't in focus at the time. So here we go. Now we're just going to, you notice I'm just slapping it on, but I'm being careful to get it in between the legs. Not so much on the sandals or their feet, uh, but then again, if it hits the sandal or feet, it's no big deal because what this is is representing the dirt that's going to be under the flock. Because when you flock, there, there's always going to be a little bit of a gap in your flock, and you will see the color of the base sometimes, and you want to make sure that that color is uh, consistent with whatever kind of base color you're wanting it to be. Uh, you could paint your base color whatever. Uh, a lot of people will paint it green. That way when you go to flock with a green flock, what you'll see, it'll make it look like your flock coverage is just that much better. Uh, I like to use brown because I like there to be gaps. Okay, there's a little bit of spackle on the bottom of his staff. So hell, I just hit, hit it with a little mud. Okay, so then we're going to, or nutmeg, and so I'm going to go ahead and continue. But yeah, I, if there's a, any gap in my flock, which there always is, I don't mind seeing dirt in between the grass. I mean, in real life, when you go out and you look at grass, there's spotches and splots and holes in the grass. It's not 100% perfect coverage. I hate models that are painted to... Uh, not painted perfectly, that's not what I'm talking about. But when the there's no errors in nature, uh, like when there's no, there, there is always an error in nature. So you got to have uh, varying colors. You can't all have the same color across the board. You, you just can't do it. You shouldn't do it. Uh, it. It adds more realism to it if there's a spot where you can see through your grass. There's a a little bit of realism when you can, uh, when the grass is too thick in one area, when the color of the grass is different in one area. You'll see some modelers will use various flock colors 
on the same model because they're, that's exactly the effect they're trying to go for. They're trying to go for some kind of realism in modeling. And uh, if you just go with, let's say, painting your model, your base, green, and then you flock with green, it's going to be very green. It's going to look green. And some, I'm going to use Games Workshop as an example. In the old days, I don't know what they do lately because I haven't watched them lately, but in the old days, they would paint their bases goblin green. And then they would flock them. And by flocking them with a green and painting the base goblin green, it really made the base green, which was fine. Because what they were trying to do is take a picture of it and put it in a magazine to emphasize the model. They wanted to take your eyes away from the base. But when you are wargaming, actually on the table, you want your miniatures to look... I don't know. I don't know how you want your miniatures to look, but I want my miniatures to look realistic. I don't want them to look... I don't want there to be a fantasy feel to my historical miniatures. So I go with, and even my even my fantasy figures, I paint with a historical feel because I don't want them to be, I want there to be realism in my fantasy games. I'm sorry. Okay, so let me go ahead and finish painting this brown. And if you notice, sometimes if I see a little bit of white on something, I will paint it brown as well, and I'll just treat that as getting dirty. Now, right now, you can kind of see, without me having to let it start drying, but you can kind of see that it's drying already, kind of in a two-tone effect. You kind of get a, you kind of get a two-tone. You see that? How there's like different tones going on? Okay, and then I kind of brush along the side of the foam. Now, the foam will soak a lot of this brown up, but what it'll do is it'll uh, kind of disguise the fact that it is a brown It'll make it look more like a burnt umber or something once it dries because it does get soaked up into the brown foam because it's porous. All right, let me do all these guys and then I'll be right back. All right, so they're all brown. You can look over on the right and you can see that there's like a two-tone effect to the brown. That's beautiful. In my opinion, that is exactly what I wanted. All right, so now I've got some Elmer's. I'm going to put it in my little uh, palette here. Um, I really don't know where I want to put everything. Everything's kind of I'm tight on for the camera. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some Elmer's glue in the palette. And then I'm going to add some water. I'm going to stir it up. And that's going to be my flock mixture. I usually, the way I work, is usually a 50-50 Elmer's with, white, uh, with water. Okay. Now, in my Folgers can to the left, that is where my flock is at. I keep that's a that's my burnt grass. Burnt grass tends to be a green brown. It's not like a bright green or it's not like a blended turf. It's more like a burnt it's more brown, okay? And I found when I when I was in Europe and also just here in the states really if I, I, would, I would drive along the highway and I would look off to the side of the road and I'd, I'd visualize the... It's strange that I would pay attention to this. <laughs> you know, I, I find myself being that perpetual modeler because I'm driving down the highway and I look out at the grass and I go, what color is that grass? That's not green. That's kind of a brown color. I'm in, I'm in Europe. Um, I'm stationed in Germany. I'm doing the same thing. I'm going. I'm visiting Bastogne in the summer. What color is that grass? It's brown. It's not green. <laughs> so I have a. I have. Um, I have a lot of. I'm gonna you get know, I'm dropping Elmer's all over everything and making a mess. Okay, let me show you my grass here, so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. See. It's green, but it's not green. It's kind of a brown green. Uh, Woodland Cynics makes that. It's beautiful. Um, when I found it, I said, man, this is like perfect. All right, let me adjust the camera. Actually, I didn't really have to adjust the camera that much. 
So let's go ahead and push that off the side, get this box back over here. So when I drop the flock, it'll fall into the little, into the box. Let me get my paintbrush and my Centurion model, because that's the one we're working with. And I put the Elmers all over everything that I painted brown. So you're going to have, okay, what am I doing now? I think I'm adjusting focus. Okay, so um, everything that I painted brown with the, with the nutmeg, I'm going to put Elmer's glue on. That way when I drop the full, and I'm going for 100% coverage here, guys. Um, I'm going for 100%. There are certain effects that I have tried in the past where I would paint like two-thirds of the base with grass, and, or I would use like a grit mixture with stones and then put grass on two-thirds of the base and those are all excellent. Those are all look excellent. But for my Romans, that's not what I want. For my, for my Roman army, what I'm going to use is uh, nutmeg all over the bases and burnt grass all over the bases. And this is something I've learned when I was painting my Warhammer armies. Back when I was painting armies for the store and we were, um, I, I think I had one of every army. I would paint the base a different color for each army and then I would flock it with a different color flock for every army every army would be different or have a different combination and when you put those armies on the table just without the uniforms being any different colors you could tell that the uh, what army they were in based on the color of the base and the flock it was pretty cool it's pretty cool so my Roman armies are all going to be brown with this burnt grass and all I do is pick it up in my hand and I sprinkle it down and I usually hold the model at about a 45 degree so it'll go down in between the legs uh, and, and get around the feet of the model and uh, leave it on the model. Now there's a big mound. The mound probably goes up to their ankles of grass and I want to leave it because you know I want it to soak into the base. All right, be right back in just a second with the next part. Okay, so I've left it left it sit for a good 10, 20 minutes, 10, 15, maybe not, maybe not 15 minutes, maybe just 10 minutes. Just let the grass soak down into the Elmers uh, because when you apply flock to Elmers, there's a surface tension on the Elmers and the flock doesn't want to stick to it. So if you shake it off too soon, you don't get uh, as thick of a grass coating. So I let it sit for about 10 minutes before I start shaking it off. Uh, and not only do I just shake it off, I also uh, am going to tap the bottom with my with my magic paintbrush. And I just tap it. Boop boop boop. <laughs> it's my magic wand. Yeah, tap it. And you can kind of see how the flock's falling off the bottom. And then I use the soft bristle brush. It's like super soft. Uh, I brush off the base. And then I I gradually I lightly brush the figure itself, avoiding the flock on the base because you don't want to brush brush any of that flock off. So I'm just I'm just kind of just hitting it because when you drop the flock on these figures, yeah, sometimes chainmail and shields uh, flock will stick to it. You don't want that. So I just brush it off. It looks good. I like the brown grass on there. It's burnt grass actually was what it's called. And then on the brown base. Let me go ahead and get all these done and then we'll come in and we'll take a look at them. But before I finish that, I want to let you know that I'm going to be using a Krylon matte finish on these guys because it gives a per protective matte finish uh, and it eliminates the glossy sheen. So basically if there's any gloss from your decals or anything like that, it'll get rid of that. All right, here's the shot you've been waiting for. This is some close-ups of the, the Romans and you can see how the gloss uh, sheen has been removed and how the decals are invisible. I really love that. I'm adjusting the focus right now. But yeah, it's uh, the gloss sheen has been completely removed. The decals look excellent. I love the uh, the uh, Warlord decals. They, they do a really good job with those. And you can see the grass on the base, how it looks kind of grassy, looks kind of realistic. You can see between the grass and you like, especially that figure base immediately that little corner on the left where you can see the brown from the underside shining through to me that's realism right there 
That's that's the way it works, right? And if you look at the model, the third model from the right, you see he's got some grass on the on his uh, pike spear. I mean his pylum, the base of his pylum. That's cool too. I must have actually accidentally hit that with a little Elmer's. I I don't have a problem with that. I think that looks good. Ah, look at that face. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm gonna slowly slide this along so you can see all the different figures. Um, just take it. Just take some time to take a look at all these guys. Looks really good. I think I did a really good job with these guys. You tell me what you guys think, man. If you think I did good, let me know. If you think this is bad or it needs it needs work, let me know. Uh, now the gloss sheen from the chainmail has been removed with the uh, spray. Uh, that's kind of cool as well. Didn't need it to be super glossy. And that was all six bases. I'm going to come at it from an angle so you can kind of see uh, what it looks like at, at an angle. Right now I'm kind of walking around adjusting focuses as well as camera angles and stuff. So yeah, I'm just going to give you guys a, a little bit of a little bit of love here and so you can see all the models. Yeah. I hate to be on the other side of that getting these guys charging me. I'd be like, "Oh my god, I'll die." No, that's not true. I've already been on the other side. It used to be in the Society for Creative Anachronisms. So if you don't know what that is, look it up. Uh, and I fought with sword and shield. Fought guys with center boss shields. You know, I hated guys with center boss shields. But, you know, hey, that was it. All right, so now uh, let me do a little. What am I doing now? I don't even know. Oh, I'm turning around so you guys can see the back side of them. Because uh, I wanted you to, you know, see the back side. Ta-da! And they're... Shirts and armor, the leather trim, the belts, you know, the flesh. Now, if you notice on the flesh, it's not perfect. Like the third model, right? You can see there's like a brown or black line on his forearm. Totally cool with that. I mean, you want imperfections. Or at least I do. I want imperfections because I want my, my people to be real. Nobody's perfect, you know what I mean? All right, so now we lift it up. Give you a overhead shot. Might not be the perfect focus here. Facing off with my Macedonian phalangites. Well, focused on the spears. <laughs> okay, now this is 24 models, six bases, right, of Romans. Uh, that's what comes in a box. That's, in my opinion, that's too many figures for a unit based on what I've read in the in the rules. My understanding is that a Roman unit is supposed to be square. Uh, so when you when you form testudo, it is the same frontage as the depth. So if a base is going to have two deep, and I put them in two ranks, then uh, it should be four wide. So two by two, a square, that's perfect. And what that does is it brings it in line with the same frontage as uh, the phalangites. Like there would be the testudo formation for the Romans, uh, because you got the four and the four, what have you. <coughs> and then they can also go into march column, which would be a two wide march column. I move the leader to the front, of course. And put these guys behind, getting out of the way of the phalangites. So you can have a march column as such, right? That looks good. Those models look good, man. I don't know. I think the once I once I uh, put the dull coat on there, I the matte finish. I think I brought the chainmail down, maybe just a little bit too much, but uh, it still looks really good. And it brings it up to the same frontage as the phalangites. Because uh, all units are, all heavy units or whatever are supposed to have kind of the same frontage. You're not supposed to be. And then those two there will be used when I build my next box. Because then I will have uh, another four for the its unit. And then it'll have two spares as well. And then combining the two 
the four spares together, I'll have a third unit. All right, thanks for coming out and checking out this video, and I'll see you next time.